This is the second and final lecture for Classical Persia. Uh, in the first lecture, we discussed the political background uh, and the political characteristics of, uh, uh, of this location and this time in history. And uh, in, this, uh, in this lecture, we'll, we'll talk about the social structure, uh, not just of the Achaemenid Empire, uh, but obviously of the, uh, uh, of the Seleucid, the Parthian, and the Sassanid, because we did see continuity throughout the time uh, we'll also talk about the economic development, uh, the significance of a prosperous agricultural society, uh, and, and what that led to uh, in classical Persia, and then finish with a short discussion of, uh, of Zoroastrianism, uh, a new faith that was introduced during uh, uh, the classical time. Uh, we start here, you can see the slide behind me is uh, uh, the Persian social structure, uh, and really just three kind of basic things that, that we need to be familiar with. Uh, the first is, is the imperial bureaucrat, uh, and the imperial bureaucrat is going to uh, really kind of join the ranks of those individuals at the top of their social hierarchy. Um, you know, the Medes and the Persians orid originally were, were a very simple people. Um, again, their social hierarchy was, was very similar to, um, to the early Aryans. Um, they, val uh, they, they valued warriors, uh, and warriors sat at the top uh, of the social structure with the priests, uh, and the political leaders with, with the kings. Uh, but, but with uh, an advanced and a more cosmopolitan uh, civilization, uh, things are going to change a bit. Um, the, the warrior is no longer going to be valued nearly as much because society isn't nearly as violent. Uh, and, and, and what you're going to need are individuals that can uh, keep society running and, and make sure the, uh, the prosperity keeps going. Uh, and it calls for an educated class. Um, a group of individuals who have taken the time, who have devoted the energy to go to school, get as smart as they possibly can, uh, and in turn, uh, those are going to be uh, your government officials, are going to be your leaders. Uh, a theme that we see throughout world history is societies, even today, we, we always want the best of the best to be in charge of us and to make decisions for us. Um, no one likes to be told what to do, uh, but, but if we are going to be told what to do, uh, we, we want those rules set by the very best that society has to offer. Um, so joining the ranks again, like I said, with, with uh, uh, the political elite, with uh, the kings, uh, will, will be the imperial bureaucrats. Um, sitting below them, you'll, you'll find the free classes. Uh, and there are two different groups of free classes. Um, first, there are those individuals that were concentrated in cities, uh, and we'll refer to those as the urban free, free classes. Uh, and then those that were concentrated, obviously, in rural areas in the countryside. Uh, and, and those would be the rural three classes. Um, artisans, merchants, craftsmen, um, low-level bureaucrats, so, so people that work for the government but yet didn't have uh, a super high level of education, um, were all considered a part of the urban free classes. Um, lived in pretty dense cities, lived close to one another, uh, constant interaction with other people, uh, and quality of life really pretty darn good uh, compared to uh, other places uh, and compared to, uh, to the rural free classes. Um, and then we had two groups within the rural free classes as well. You had your, your land-owning peasants and then you had your non-land-owning peasants. Uh, and, and if you were fortunate enough to own your own land, um, life was a little better off um, in terms of, of income and what you had available to you. Uh, yet, yet if you were a, a low-ranking peasant, um, an individual who unfortunately did not own land, you, you subsequently had to rent land from someone, uh, be it one of those bureaucrats, be it a, a temple community, um, be it a, a wealthy merchant or individual, and you had to go ahead and pay rent to them, which kind of kept you stuck in that bottom portion of the, uh, of the social ladder. Uh, and then at the very, very bottom of, uh, of Persian society, you had slaves. Um, and, and when we think of slaves, obviously life sucks, it, it, it's not good. Um, but within classical Persia, the, the, the designation of slave was, was classified a bit different. Um, you know, two ways that you became, you became a slave. Um, first, uh, being a war criminal. Um, uh, or two, you, you, you became in debt. Um, if, if you took out loans to start a business, per se, business fails, uh, you can no longer repay your debts. You, you're not declaring bankruptcy at this time in history. Uh, you're simply uh, becoming, becoming a slave. 
Uh, as an individual, you could sell your family into slavery to uh, uh, forgive outstanding debts. Um, and just because you became a slave didn't necessarily mean that life was over. Um, maybe you were a slave temporarily uh, until those debts were, were paid off and then you could go back to the, uh, the ranks of, uh, of the free classes. Um, nonetheless, uh, bottom of the social ladder, uh, you had slaves. Uh, moving forward, uh, here you have some thoughts on agriculture and economics. Um, first and foremost, Persia, um, again, encompassing Egypt, Anatolia, Mesopotamia, and all the way to, uh, uh, to the Indus River Valley was a land of really kind of amazing agricultural production. Um, they were super lucky in, in that they simply had prime real estate uh, where, where stuff grew really, really well with, uh, with minimal effort. Um, and what this allowed to happen was not too many people had to farm. And if not too many people have to farm, that frees up a whole sector of your population that can go ahead and go out and do other things. Um, you know, we, we talk about specialization a lot. Um, you know, we, we had regional specialization, as you see in this final bullet point, uh, which means that people did what they were best at. Uh, if you live in Anatolia and you're a phenomenal farmer, uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, if you live in the Indus River Valley and you grow this product really well, well, go ahead and do that. Yet, if you live in an area where agriculture is not great, uh, yet you have um, great skills working with metal, well, wh why doesn't that become your main focus and that becomes your, your full-time job? Um, so the degree of specialization reaches a point in classical Persia that we've never seen before. Uh, and, and that is just yet another component uh, of how societies grow and transform um, over time. Uh, trade was also something that was used regularly. Um, classical Persia was, was super well connected. Uh, we talked earlier about the Persian royal roads, um, you know, connecting Anatolia to Persepolis. From Persepolis, you could get to get to India. Um, so one with, with the the safe travel ensured on that road, plus the proximity of oceans, the, the, the Arabian Sea, the Indian Ocean. Um, basically, trade is exploding. And with trade explo exploding, the, uh, uh, the economy is growing, life is good for people, and uh, one of the reasons why classical Persia was such a, such a prosperous spot. Um, real quick also to talk about standardization of coins, there is a, a secondary reading in your text that uh, it, it's important that you are familiar with. Uh, you know, in, in the foundations period and before, they, they, they relied on something called a barter economy. It's like, I, I, I want that chicken and I have a goat, well, well why don't I give you a goat and you can give me five chickens. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, yet it's not exactly the most efficient way to exchange goods. Um, so, so when the Akimunid Empire issued, issued standardized coins, it just made life so much easier. Uh, and with life so much easier, um, and, and making purchasing that much easier, the economy was really able to grow. Um, you know, we, we see it even kind of develop into, in, into today, you know. Coins were eventually replaced with paper money. Um, paper money, as we're seeing today, is being uh, changed with electronic currency. Um, you know, you can walk around with a plastic card today and just slide here, slide there, uh, never really exchanging anything, uh, just agreeing that you will make a, make a payment. And so if you think about the relative ease that we have today, um, I, I think that's kind of how people felt uh, when they could just simply rely on coins and could move away from, from that barter economy. Um, economics, uh, superior uh, and uh, a, a very, very, very good uh, ability for, 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 the, for the classical version. Um, and then finally you have Zoroastrianism. And I'm not going to talk a ton about Zoroastrianism other than just to point out this quote right here. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Um, there's actually another video that's linked up onto uh, the YouTube channel that I'd encourage you to take a look at if uh, you still have some questions on Zoroastrianism. Uh, it, it, it'll set the background uh, and, and give you the main characteristics, uh, and uh, I think you'll find it to be a bit interesting. Uh, this concludes our, our discussion of classical Persian. Thank you.